Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of A Piano in the Pyrenees by Tony Hawk. So this is non-fiction, the ups and downs of an English man in the French mountains. I'm going to go uh, and read the blurb from the back for you, and then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, if you had to pick two things you wanted, if you had to, what would you pick? I hesitated. I suppose the honest answer would be meeting my soulmate and finding an idyllic house abroad somewhere. Inspired by breathtaking views and romantic dreams of finding love in the mountains, Tony Hawks impulsively buys a house in the French Pyrenees. Here, he plans to finally fulfil his childhood fantasy of mastering the piano, untroubled by the problems of the world. In reality, the chaotic story of Tony's hopelessly ill-considered house purchase reads like the definitive guide to how not to buy a home overseas. It finds him flirting with the removal business in a disastrous attempt to transport his piano to France in a dodgy white van, foolishly electing to build a swimming pool himself. And expanding, his relationship rep and expanding his relationship repertoire when he starts cohabiting, not with an exquisite French beauty, but a middle-aged builder from West London. As Tony and his friends haplessly attempt to fit into village life, they learn more about themselves and each other than they ever imagined. So yeah, it's like humorous travel writing. It's kind of the forerunner of like a lot of the Dave Gormans and stuff. And I just want to start by reading the apologies section here right at the front. I would like to apologise for not having a thanks section at the front of this book. Frankly, these are very dull to read unless you happen to be one of the people getting a mention, and, let's face it, you probably aren't. However, if you do happen to be one of the people who have helped with this book in some way, then well done. Without you, this apology section wouldn't have been possible. So, um, Hawks is great for just a lot of these little throwaway lines. So, for example, here he says, um, Cabin crew, 10 minutes to landing, announced the captain, as if the rest of us would be landing at a completely different time. And he starts to worry, like, what's going to happen if he does actually buy this house? So, uh... Kevin looked thoughtful for a moment, holding on tight to his big plastic bag full of pants. Tony, if you ended up buying this place, what would you do in it, he said, as the drive into the mountains became ever more picturesque. I'm playing devil's advocate here, but isn't there a good chance that you'll just end up sitting on your own and admiring the view? I'll invite friends over, I replied defensively. I'll have parties. We'll go skiing in the winter and we'll have mountain walks in the summer. I see, said Kevin, who was patently aware of my deficiencies as a social secretary. I'd once invited everyone I knew to a party on my birthday and then failed to attend it myself. I'd been invited on holiday at short notice and I judged that to be the far better option. I left the keys to my flat with a mate and the party was alleged to have been a great success, some of the more unkind guests saying that it had gone better than it would if I'd been present. Kevin looked over at me with a cheeky glint in his eye. Yes, I'll look forward to you organising all that. And then we get uh, a little nod here, I suppose, to uh, societal expectations towards masculinity and whatnot. Um, so he goes, At this point, it is worth taking a moment to mention an unwritten rule of the road. Generally speaking, in this chauvinistic dominion, it is deemed forgivable if a woman fails to locate a petrol cap. Sometimes even a man can be forgiven, provided that he is an artsy-fartsy, namby-pamby type who clearly wouldn't make heterosexuality a specialist subject on mastermind. However, there is a tacit understanding that those who drive around in large Luton vans are fully compostmentous with how their vehicle works. And by that I mean that they would be expected to throw the bonnet open at the slightest hint of engine trouble and sort the problem out with minimal fuss. Anyone in charge of a large van who fails in this regard lets the rest down very badly. It's not unfair to say, therefore, that it is generally accepted that the driver of a big Luton van ought to be able to find the petrol cap when he is in a filling station, unaided. I, however, was not coming up with any answers as to the location of the petrol cap, and cars were beginning to build into a queue behind me. In desperation, I looked around for help. I needed to ask someone, but I was scared. I didn't want to admit that I was a bloke in a van who couldn't find his petrol cap. It would just be too, too embarrassing. There were two other van drivers on the forecourt, and I took a deep breath and tried to determine which one looked less like he had a criminal record, which, as it happened, wasn't an obvious choice. I selected the stocky red-headed man on the grounds that his van was cleaner and that this might mean he was a more compassionate type. I was fully aware, however, that as soon as I opened my mouth, I would lose all dignity. And then uh, he decides to set off, he's setting off to France with his friend Tim and uh, they're out in this basically shit heap of a van that he's bought. Tim and I began our first conversation of the trip, experimenting with the volume levels that would be required on board such a noisy vehicle. Sleep well last night, I called out, perhaps slightly louder than necessary. Like a baby! He shouted back. I didn't ask if this meant that he'd woken every two hours screaming and then fouled himself. I thought this was quite an interesting little observation here. The afternoon saw the first of the many managerial chores that face any overseas home purchaser. I needed to open a bank account. We forget just how laden our adult lives have become with administrative and bureaucratic baggage. 
Because we have taken a number of years to acquire our bank accounts, credit cards, insurance policies, driver's licenses, national insurance numbers and the rest, we have forgotten just how uninspiring and tedious each individual acquisition happened to be. Now that I had chosen to establish my bureaucratic presence in a new nation state, a veritable plethora of dreary, pompous and largely incomprehensible French paperwork lay in wait for me. One morning he wakes up to find out that he has, uh, it says, uh, disappointed to find that I had what the French call un guerre de bois, wooden gob, and what we British call a hangover. Yeah, that's one of the many dialect words that I thought was important for me to learn, so I knew that one. Actually, his French in this is quite interesting because, I mean, I found it pretty easy to follow along with all the conversations. But I think even if you were just like, just had high school French, you'd be able to get the, gris get the, get the gist of what's being said, you know. He only switches to French in this for like, humorous exchanges, I guess. But it was interesting to me because I have experimented, well, toyed with the idea of going out to live in France. And I still might do that one day at some point in my life. So he goes out and um, in engages in some of the local traditions and whatnot, and we get here. Uh, a grey-haired man with chiselled angular features approached me, proffering a plastic cup of red wine. I readily accepted, even though it was only 11.30am, and, as everybody knows, drinking before midday means that you're only one step away from being an alcoholic. And then uh, he tr he's trying to explain that he doesn't eat meat. He does actually cave as well, because basically he was mostly not eating meat to try and impress somebody years ago, and had just remained vegetarian. But, um... Yeah, so we've got here, uh, Pork ou poulet, she asked. Pork or chicken? Was this a question about my preference for the main course, or the opening gambit of a traditional local word game? Either way, I got the answer wrong. Avez-vous quelque chose sans bien? The girl looked at me like I was utterly mad. Had she heard me correctly? Was I really asking if they had anything without me? Pardon, she said. Avez-vous quelque chose sans bien? I repeated. The girl tipped her head to one side and gave me a moment to demonstrate that I'd been joking. France is not a great place for the non-meat eater. Years before I'd been on holiday here with friends, one of whom was a vegetarian. When we'd asked him if they had anything without meat, the waiter had replied, is ham okay? So we get this great little quote here from Colonel Bantry. Bottled, was he? said Colonel Bantry, with an Englishman's sympathy for alcoholic excess. Oh well, can't judge a fellow by what he does when he's drunk. When I was at Cambridge, I remember I put a certain utensil. Well, well, never mind. Deuce of a row that was about it. Lovely. So I thought this little mini rant here was quite amusing, um, where he talks about what it means to go shopping. Uh, he says, well, it was and it wasn't. By and large, I have a love-hate relationship with these places. By and large, I love hating them. You, the shopper, are seduced by the fact that you can get everything you need in the one place. But once you get inside, you end up spending hours trying to find the right aisle for what you're seeking. And when you finally get to the checkout, after what seemed like hours of ill-tempered trudging, you realise you've forgotten the sugar. You are then faced with a mile and a half walk back to the aisle where the sugar is, by which time someone with a trolley piled as high as Mount Snowden has usurped your place in the queue. When you reach the checkout girl, you discover that at least four of the items in your trolley haven't been priced correctly and the girl has to ring a bell and wave your item in the air until a spotty man appears, looks at your item and then buggers off while she wait patiently and everyone behind you looks at you like you've killed more innocent people than Slobodan Milosevic and Saddam Hussein put together. When you finally pay for your goods, you make the generous gesture of paying in cash so that the people behind are spared further delay. But the checkout girl slows everything up by having the gall to hold each banknote you give her up to the light to check that it's not forged. When when this happens to me, I think that it's only right and proper to do exactly the same with each item of shopping I've purchased. Extravagantly, I reach down for the breakfast cereal and brandish it aloft, saying, Hey, these Weetabix are counterfeit. The, real, the result is usually one of all-round bad feeling. Fraught, tired, and immensely frustrated, you return to your vehicle, hoping that it won't be your turn to be the car that gets dented by that driver. That driver, of course, is the elderly one who can't handle manoeuvring in the kind of car park that crams a thousand cars into a space suitable for 257. If lucky, or even if unlucky, you exit the car park as fast as you can, swearing that you'll never visit one of these places again. A promise that you keep until the next time that you actually need some shopping. So you get a reference here of him being a new man. It says, male readers might like to test how much of a new man they are. In the street, if there is a woman walking towards you to whom you are greatly attracted, then your new manness is measured by the distance you allow her to continue walking past before you turn around to see what, what she looks like from behind. I'm about a five yarder. Duck a point if you mumble nice cull under your breath called meaning bottom in French. Uh, I don't do that. At least I don't think I do. Maybe I do, maybe it's human nature. Pretty sure I don't know. Try not to look at people outside to be honest. 
We get to a bit where he's talking about when he needs to take a leak, so he stops his car at the side of the road and says, So it was that I opened my zip, popped out my huge and unwieldy member, and made use of a suitable tree which afforded me the requisite privacy from the road. And uh, unwieldy member has an asterisk next to it that says, I wonder if this sentence means that the book will find its way into the fiction section in bookshops. We get this, which I think could be a description of me. Ron loves music, but he's not a social animal, and tonight won't be his thing because there'll be people there. We get here, he says, Batard, I said under my breath in my best French. What does that mean? asked a smiling Brad, who had overheard it. It's, for sh it's French for someone who's born just outside a Cornish village. Which one? Wedlock. Oh, I see. And he's dancing a poker with a French woman, and we get to... Uh, what is that face you're pulling, said Monique, as she spun me round on yet another hasty circuit of the generously sized dance floor. Are you in pain? No, I'm concentrating, I replied. Ah, so this is your poker face. Was this a witty remark, or had Monique just made a joke by accident? I hoped it wasn't the former, since I was some years away from making a joke like that in French. Here we get, I think this is an interesting comparison of the two cultures. So he writes, Just like the young people, I drank too much that night. I hadn't intended to, nor did I want to. It was just that the wine kept flowing. The volunteer waiters and waitresses simply plonked another bottle in front of us just as soon as we'd polished off the previous one. Being British, my formative years had seen me nurtured in a drinking culture where you kept going until someone told you to stop. At the absurdly early time of 11 o'clock on a Friday or Saturday night, an unsightly man would usually appear and bellow at you. Come on, finish off your drinks now please, we've all got homes to go to. It had taken me a long time to get used to places where you were welcome as long as you wanted to stay there, and despite lots of practice, I still wasn't one of the leading exponents of self-regulation. Some days it might be fair to call me a mountaineer drinker. I drink it because it's there. And he's got a bet on with somebody that the Pope's going to die during his visit, so I think Lord's there. So it says, Of course it could happen, I realised. Of course it could happen, I reasoned. If there is a God, and the Pope certainly seemed to be of that opinion from what I gleaned from a lot of his statements, then I'd noticed that every now and then he seemed to demonstrate something of a penchant for cruel irony. One example of this was the Lisbon earthquake of 1775 that killed 90,000 people, one third of the city's population. God managed to arrange for this to happen on All Saints Day, exactly when the churches were full of people who were busy worshipping him. I reckon that he was due another such act of grievous mischief, and allowing the pontiff to snuff it in the very place where pilgrims flocked for miracle cures fitted the bill perfectly. Alas, the Pope didn't die. I say alas, obviously I don't want anybody I don't wish death on people. And uh, then he meets him with Andre, an old guy who's like the fountain of all wisdom, and he asks him if uh, the chicken he was now eating was one of his own. Fiance, naturellement, he replied. That must be tough, I thought. Eating something you've been living with. Most meat eaters console themselves with the fact that they're consuming a creature that they wouldn't recognise. I wonder what percentage of us would be vegetarians if we had to kill and eat the very animal that we'd been feeding and nurturing for months. Well, yes, quite. So all in all, I did enjoy A Piano in the Pyrenees by Tony Hawks. It's probably not my favourite of his books, and I've read like three maybe now. Uh, but it was alright. I'd still give it like a pretty solid 3.5, maybe 3.75 out of 5. Uh, my attention did start to wane towards the end. It also had... It kind of left you feeling as though tons of stuff was happening super quickly. Um, just, I guess, I don't know. It just... The, the pacing of it was a bit weird, I guess. And that's kind of strange to say, bearing in mind it was about real life or whatever it just felt like the first half of the book happened over like six weeks and then the remaining half happened over like two years or something i don't know but yeah overall i did enjoy it would recommend a piano in the pyrenees if you're interested in some humorous non-fiction some travel writing so there you have it, that's what I made of A Piano in the Pyrenees by Tony Hawks. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.